Okay, my name is Stephen Rogers, and I'm the Executive Director for Africa Faith and Justice Network. On this program, Josephine Ghanem, our MC, was actually supposed to moderate this, but she had asked me to, to do that on her behalf. So it's a real big, it's a big work. So I will do my best. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce, uh, let me introduce to you our panelists for today's, uh, for this session, the U.S.-Africa Relations Opportunities and Challenges. All right, I'm going to start with Reverend Dr. Angelic Walker-Smith, who is no stranger to Africa Faith and Justice Network. We've worked on several things. I, I, I know I love to read people's bio, even the shortest one. So I'm just going to read what you already have. She is a strategist for Pan-African and Orthodox faith communities at Bread for the World, which Father Roku talked about, and we, work, we do a lot of work together. She was selected to be a member of the Preparatory Working Group for the new United Nations Permanent Forum of People of African Descent. She received a doctorate degree from Princeton Theological Seminary. She serves on the governing board of the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches, and as a president of the historic Black churches, Christian churches together. She brings extensive global, national, and local experience as a faith and public engagement thought leader, journalist, speaker, broadcaster, scholar, preacher, and yes, author. So ladies and gentlemen, actually she's writing a book now. We talked about that yesterday. Please give your hands up to Reverend Dr. Angelic Walker-Smith. Thank you, Angelic. Thank you, Angelic. Our next panelist is Dr. Michael Adovino. Dr. Aduvino is a policy analyst at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, with a particular emphasis on, on religious freedom in sub-Saharan Africa. Prior to joining USCIRF, he served two years in the U.S. Department of State's Office of Interna International Religious Freedom on the IRF reports team. He also held the position of senior research analyst focusing on democracy, human rights, and governance for several years in, at the USAID. Dr. Adovino has conducted field research in Benin, Togo, Ghana, Tunisia, Kenya, Morocco, South Africa, Eswatini, Zimbabwe, and Egypt, and conducted additional foreign policy research in 20 other African countries. He received his doctorate, his doctor of philosophy in politics from the Catholic University of America, and a master of arts in comparative government and politics from University of North Texas. He completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in government from the University of Texas at Austin and a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice from Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. Give it up a big hand for Dr. Aluvino. And I am your Bye. humble moderator, Stephen Rogers, who will sit between these two giants. And just so to update you, I'm Dr. Abdul Karim Bangura. I couldn't make it. He had an emergency, I think. The United States... African relations have evolved from history, geopolitics, and socioeconomics. Aligning with Africa's aspirations is vital. This involves fair trade, technological transfer, innovation, and capacity building. Therefore, upholding governance, human rights, and anti-corruption efforts is paramount. Now, this panel discusses the opportunities and challenges of these important relationships. We specifically chose this panel because of the wealth of experience they bring and because of the work that AFJN does um, in terms of U.S. relationship mm -hmm. with Africa. And that's exactly the reason why we were here in 1983 and we have been here for 40 years because we know this relationship is integral to what Africa the Africa we want to see in the future. So what I'm going to do is to ask, originally I told, I told them to prepare some opening remarks for eight minutes. Um, unfortunately, because Dr. Karim can't make it, so they might have two minutes more. Unfortunate in terms of circumstance, but luckily you have the brevity to say a little bit more Angelic and the mic, and I will be the strict moderator. I'll try to be. <laughs> All right. So I will start the, um, why don't we have an opening? And the idea is to 
focus on the areas that we talked about and just briefly give an overview of your topic. Angelique, I'll give you eight minutes and then we'll go on to Mike. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I bring you greetings from Breath for the World, based in Washington, D.C. And also I bring you greetings from the World Council of Churches, where I serve as World Council of Churches president from North America and also from the historic Black churches of Christian churches together. It is my profound honor to be with this celebration. 40 years, I'm so impressed. So can I just invite us to give another hand? I am so glad to be with you. AFJN has been a partner with Bread before I got to Bread in 2014, right? So I'm just following the great legacy, right? So I am so honored to do so. Bread loves AFJN. And I must say, you must give me a bit of executive privilege. Dr. Sister Faustine over there was with us at Bread, and she's one of the key reasons why Bread has this great legacy is uh, Miss Faustine Wabuire over there, who is my beloved sister. <laughs> so thank you so much to Dr. Stephen. God bless you to my brother Bahati, his lovely wife. Uh, of course, Father Curry. I mean, you already know how big he is, right? So uh, just saying, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, I know I took thirty seconds on my eight minutes, so you'll give me that thirty seconds back, please. But I had to say it. That has to be said. Congratulations on behalf of my president, not just me, but Reverend Eugene Cho. So all I want to say is there's too much to say, as you know, and I have eight minutes to say something. So what I'm going to do is just outline, just say what the seven issues are that I think we need to bring into focus as we have this conversation. Then I'll go back if I have time to say more about each one of the points. But I want to make sure you have the seven that I've identified, Okay. The first one has to do between Africa and her children, the African diaspora. I think that is a key issue that we have to talk about internally and externally. We have we don't know each other the way we ought, right? We just don't. And so that piece internally of reconciliation amongst us within the diaspora, Africa's children with Africa, relationship building, learning to love one another for this season, rewriting the narrative of who we are and who we have been. That's the first one, the piece of being African and in the African diaspora, all of us being African and what that internal and external reconciliation means. Externally meaning how do we use policy and structures to work in our collective interests, not in our separate interests, understanding we are Ubuntu, we are one. And how do we bring those two legacies together throughout the world? That's the first point I want to make. I'll say more about that if I have time. But number two is the mutual empowerment of women. I, I just have to say that. So we have women's leadership and their mutual empowerment with women. Women who empower us and who we also empower. Mutual empowerment, women's leadership. I think has to be on the mo on the scene in this moment. Third, the third issue I want to raise is the issue of economics and trade. We know that we must have a better economic order. I'm in conversations right now with CARICOM, uh, the governance of the Caribbean um, uh, Caribbean region. Uh, some of you may know the name Dr. David Kamasong, and that particular governance area for the Caribbean. I'm so happy is building out a conversation with the new free trade uh, continental agreement of the African Union to build out a partnership with the Caribbean and the African Union. I think that is a way forward. The whole continental free trade agreement, also working with the diaspora in places like the Caribbean, those meetings are happening. It's so exciting. And so I think that's a key piece. I think rethinking the uh, IFIs, the international financial institutions, and what that means for us as people of Africa is key in that conversation. Also, AGOA. I've been working on the advisory group of AGOA, a U.S. policy that really is trying to I mean, there are some challenges with it, but I have to say it because Brad was in the leadership of that. Ms. Faustine was there when it happened. Um, AGOA is a way to say that democratic principles matter. AGOA is a way to say that trade matters. 
AGOA is a way to say, yeah, um, we have to find some ways to lift up when these evolutions of democratic principles are being raised on the continent and to lift them up visibly. So um, I'm a supporter of AGOA. We're in the process of reauthorizing. So any of you who know congressional leaders, let's get that done, uh, trying to reauthorize uh, AGOA even in this moment. Also, the Jubilee. Um, at Bread for the World, we're discussing now a Jubilee 2.0. Some of you know we did this, the debt relief piece back in 2000. I know I was a part of that at World Council of Churches. I wasn't at Bread at that time, but Bread was in that conversation. And we're looking at what that means now next year in terms of being about the jub a new, another Jubilee debt-free for the nations of Africa and her uh, siblings. And then we also want to speak about the issue of uh, youth, mutual youth empowerment. Again, youth, we know that young people, especially on the continent, are like in the majority, as I understand, in the numbers. So what does it mean to be led by young people in this moment and for us to also empower? So that mutual empowerment piece relative to young people and what that means in this moment. And I would say in the diaspora as well but particularly on the continent, as we think about the future of Africa, how do young people come to the top in terms of our priorities? The other issue that I would like to raise is around the issue of climate. Climate and in Bread for the World, we're working on issues around climate, uh, cl climate justice, we're very clear, climate justice relative to the continent of Africa. Some of you know that just last month was a huge climate summit on the continent of Africa in uh, Kenya. And it was a big deal. Um, I am pleased to say that Bread for the World has been a part of those conversations. I am also pleased to say the brother to my right was there with us at Bread for the World in Kenya and Nairobi last year when we were getting ready for COP27. I must commend him publicly. He helped us to shape our faith statement. And I gave to Brother Bahati all the links to all of this stuff. So I'm not going to have all the time I need. But he was there and I want to celebrate that. And there were about 65 leaders throughout Europe, uh, through Africa and the U.S. That's I got to play a key strategist role in pulling that together. I'm very honored to say uh, we were hosted by the All Africa Conference of Churches, where I'm on my way to next month, by the way, where their 60th anniversary is so exciting. But AACC is all about it from the faith lens and Bread for the World is too. We have now have, we now have a climate fellow at Bread for the World and I get to work with her in planning out our future together on some of those issues. So climate and food insecurity, they go together. The, one dovetails after the other, right? And we have World Food Day. If you don't know it, write it down. Next week, 16th of, of October is World Food Day. So you have a moment to lift, lift that up in a really visible way. And I'm pleased to say we're going to have a webinar about that on the 20th. And that's on the links I sent to Brother Bahati also on food, insec food insecurity, trade, and economics. And then I also want to lift up this piece around uh, rewriting the narrative. I think this is really important. We are all children of the colonial history. We, we know this, right? And that's one of the reasons why we don't know each other the way we ought, because that design of being together in the world actually created division. It created some unity for some folks in some places, but for people of Africa and African diaspora, we have to rewrite our own narrative around what it means for us to be a community and to introduce that into the policy space. Then I'm going to conclude with two other points and I will be finished. And that is the piece around there being um, the United Nations Permanent Forum of People of African Descent that goes back to the pieces around Africa and the African diaspora. I am so excited <laughs> that in December of last year, after since 2021 in Durban, South Africa, thank you very much. We now have a permanent forum of people of African descent in the UN space. And I was honored to be there for the, yeah, that's right. Give a hand right there. <laughs> and I was uh, happy for the last three to four years to be one of the global advocates for that coming out of Durban into the international decade of people of African descent that morphed into now the permanent forum of people of African descent. We had our first meeting. Yes, we did in December in Geneva, Switzerland. 
And I was honored to be there uh, for Bread for the World and for World Council of Churches as one of their presidents. And we launched the conversation. Can I tell you how beautiful it was to be in a global policy space of folk like me throughout the world who haven't gathered together in that kind of way, systematic in front of the member nations of the world, of the UN, and to say, this is what we say. Not what you say to us since Berlin in 1884-85, but what do we have to say to you? I can't begin to tell you how powerful it was. I mean, I'm almost brought to tears thinking about it, but we celebrated that we were together Look, we danced in the halls of the United Nations. Yes, we did. We had drums. <laughs> we had music. Uh, we had celebrations on the side. We just hugged each other. But I must tell you, some of the most brilliant minds in that family were in that room. And the uh, seven commissioners, the official United States commissioner is Dr. Justin Hansford from Howard University. And he represents the US, but we have representatives throughout the diaspora and Africa is there. It's not just the diaspora, but Africa is also there. And so we have come up now with our fundamental conclusions and recommendations. We met in Geneva and we've just met in New York in April of this year. And at the UN General Assembly just a few weeks ago, our report went to the member states. Yes, it did. So we're all waiting to see what they said. We, I wasn't able to be there, but the commissioners were. But that's happening and it's permanent. I invite you to be prayerful for us in that regard. That's really important, I think, to the future around the opportunities and challenges we have. Then the last point I'll make is the president of the United States, President Biden, has just announced his executive order for an African Diaspora Commission. We now have the names and the names include, quote, highly visible, quote, like Viola Davis. OK, come on. You need to know, you know, Viola Davis, right? OK, <laughs> she's on there. But there are some other people who are pragmatists and who are also uh, theorists and academics who are also on that commission. And it was just announced. And so we're waiting with bated breath to know more about what is going to be done besides naming these uh, uh, persons to this commission. But it came out of the recent meeting with African nation state leaders recently uh, that this diaspora commission has taken place. So excited about that. There's some other devotional things I can mention. I can't leave without saying uh, Pan-African Women of Faith. Uh, we've been around since 2013. We were founded in Busan, South Africa, South, South Korea, not South Africa. Can you believe that? We were founded in Korea, South Korea. Yes, we were. Uh, it was a world assembly of the World Council of Churches. And we were conceived there. And there were women from uh, Africa and the African diaspora. We've been meeting since 2013. When I came to Bread for the World, Bread received it. We became partners with the World Council of Churches. Uh, a few of you have been involved with that. Uh, and now, uh, after a lot of other writing of journals, conferencing, annual conferencing, on November the 1st through the 3rd, we will meet here in Washington, D.C. and celebrate a new book uh, that I have coming out uh, about women who were born by 1939. Yes, we were there before. And that though her stories, she wrote, need to be told. This book tries to do some of that. So God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to have these opening remarks. Wow. Thank you so much. We couldn't have started on a better note. <laughs> and I, I'm absolutely, and thank you so much, Angelique, for sharing these. And we're probably going to go through all of these. I'm pretty sure the audience has a lot of questions in terms of follow-up. And I hand over to um, Dr. Adovino. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your uh, anniversary, right, FJN? This is a big year for anniversaries. That's the 75th anniversary of the UD UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of course, which was established in 1948. Two weeks ago, I was in Provo, Utah, attending a conference celebrating that with uh, clerics from across the world, academics, economists, and all types of specialists. And we're all talking about how to improve religious freedom uh, in very many countries. And I met Many, uh, many of your peers from across Africa, including Nigerian judges, uh, Ghanaian parliamentarians, uh, many, many people. So uh, speaking of anniversaries, uh, I'm talking about, I want to talk about my office. Uh, it's the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. It's USERF. Uh, in 1990.
1988, the International Religious Freedom Act was established and signed into, into law by President Bill Clinton. Uh, you, uh, the IRFA Act, IRFA Act, IRFA, established my office, USERF. Uh, we're the smallest of all the uh, offices in the government. Now, the U.S. government is very large and complex. Thomas Hobbes called uh, a leviathan the vast unity of the state. The U.S. The US government is very, definitely vast, but it's not always unified. Uh, in this case, in terms of religious freedom, there is unity. Thank goodness. Um, my office is part of the legislative branch, the Congress. We're very small, and essentially we're unheard of. Nobody knows about us. We're pretty, um, we have nine commissioners who are appointed by the president and the, the two uh, bodies in Congress, the House and the Senate. And each uh, commissioner serves two years, and they can serve up to four years, so that is two terms. And they're, they're split between both political parties, Democrats and Republicans. And the president, uh, he picks it, you know, his, if he's in power, he picks his appointees, he, who he wants. And the Congress, uh, both sides, both parties pick their membership, up, as long as there's nine members, and it balances out. Now, believe it or not, both parties can get along. Uh, yeah, but when it comes to religious freedom, there's a consensus. Protect everybody. It's so impressive to see it in, 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 in action every day when I go to work. To see, uh, there's agreement on protecting Muslims, protecting Catholics, Christians, protecting Buddhists. Uh, protecting, protect, protecting secular humanists, Mubarak Bala, a very famous Nigerian, is someone we're trying to help right now who's been in, incarcerated in Nigeria. Uh, he's a very well-known person, um, and it's part of my task in my office to help him when I work with uh, NGOs such as AFJN. Now, uh, you surf, uh, again, I mentioned there's nine commissioners. Uh, I'm part of the, the small staff of about 20 people. And we have we have regional expertise. Uh, I'm a Sub-Saharan African expert. We have a uh, Middle East expert. We have a Latin American expert uh, all across the world. But we're so small, we can only really focus on about 20 countries. Uh, yeah, because we only work with uh, the commissioners. The commissioners are all they're all volunteers. They aren't paid to do their jobs, and they're all very important, well knowledge well knowledge about what they do. Uh, some of them are former clerics or current clerics, and we have Muslims, Christians. Uh, We've had Buddhists in the past, all, all types of faiths represented in the commission. Um, right now, our chair is uh, Dr. Abraham Cooper, who is a rabbi, and he's very vocal. Uh, and, and his his co-chair is uh, Fred Davey, who is a Democrat. Uh, and they're they're quite a collaborative effort to work with them. It's a pleasure to work with them. Now, what we do is we try to find countries that are violate religious freedom across the world systematically egregiously and you know they're really bad countries because we're so small and what we do is we, we label these countries cpcs countries of particular concern and we have about eight of those approximately more or less it changes depending on you know what happens in the world and we have a second list of countries called special watch a special watch list of countries and they're not as they're not as you know as bad in, in terms of perpetrating religious freedom violations so that's swl and so we pick these countries. We have a lot more freedom to go after uh, the bad countries. Uh, and, and what we do is we recommend to the State Department, to the president, to the executive branch, and to the Congress, which countries should be listed as CPC and special watch list at State Department. That is officially, the only State Department and executive branch can utilize sanctions, official sanctions against uh, perpetrators of violations uh, through the Treasury Department and uh, through the State Department, things of that sort. So we're an advocate for the Congress. Our commissioners work with the Congress in a very vocal public forum, uh, you know, whereas the State Department doesn't quite, doesn't think differently, obviously. So, uh, again, 2016, uh, the Frank Wolf Act, who Frank Wolf is, is a commissioner currently, uh, we established a special watch list, which is, you know, gives us a little more flexibility in going after countries that are not quite as egregious uh, in perpetrating. Now, uh, USERF is, is a legislative branch, part of the legislative branch, very small. Uh, of course, the State Department, uh, they're, they're, that's the uh, Office of International Religious Freedom. It was also established in 1998 by the IRFA Act. Okay, As you can imagine, they're much larger, and they look at every country in the world. Uh, and they produce what they, what they call an annual IRFA report uh, on every country. 199 reports are produced every year. I should know because I worked on about 30 of those reports last year, so including Kenya and a couple other African countries. And of course... The people who write these reports are generally at the embassies overseas, they're the drafting officers, and they work with a, a group of retired Foreign Service officer editors, and they produce these fabulous products. I don't know if you, if you had a chance to read their earth reports before. You can download them online. They're online. 
Uh, now, our reports, Earthquake produces an annual report, but we, we combine all our countries into one report, uh, you know, roughly 25 or 30 countries. Uh, so you can look at all, you know, it's much smaller, much smaller. Uh, you can imagine every country versus 20 countries. So, yeah, they go after everybody. We go after the, the most egregious actors. Now, of course, the State Department office, Earth office, has about 45 to 50 people that, in the, that are regular civil service officers or contractors, and they're specialists. They, they focus on the different regions of the world, just, just like we do, but there's many more of them. And of course, they have their editors who work on their reports. So they're much larger. They have a lot much larger tasks to do in terms of producing annual reports. So, but we work in collaboration with the Earth Office, but we also have different, sometimes we have different goals and objectives. So we try to influence them and we can use the public forum to a greater extent than they can because they, you know, they work with the ambassadors. They, they often use back channels with the governments that they're working with overseas. So we, you know, we don't really do that as much, but. Now, what do the Earth Office and the user Office have in common? We work with civil society organizations and faith-based organizations, FBOs, such as such as this organization. Right, very important, critical actor in helping protect religious freedom rights across the world. You now, uh, FBOs will give us information, but you know what's happening to people in, in respective countries that we can't get, you know, from other sources. Uh, we often use the, the media, but of course, the media is not always as reliable as we want them to be. So, our NGOs and FBOs are our, our most critical resource for information. State Department does the same thing. And they often work with the uh, foreign service embassies, officers in the embassies there. But we, again, we can you know get information from the state if it's publicly useful. We can you know put it out there. Uh, again, everything we put out is public. And the State Department doesn't always do that. They keep things you know a little bit more hush hush. Um, state Department also has uh, some money to use you know to help uh, churches, FBOs, you know, and NGOs protect religious freedom. A very small pot that they work with. Uh, we don't really do that. We just we just take information, advise, and write. So for a different role for legislative branch. And again, uh, and another example of what the State Department does is they have all the embassies. And so one important thing that the State Department does is each embassy has an ambassador or a charge d'affaires, and they meet with each you know NGOs, respective NGOs, every country that they're in, and they they hear from these countries you know what's going on in the countries if there's any you know any problems. They tell our ambassador or our charge d'affaires. And of course, that relates back to Washington. And of course, yeah, we can try to help, you know, we can or the State Department can help in that situation. I'll give you an example. In 2022, in Kenya, obviously an important country, uh, the ambassador met with roughly 10 or, 10 or 12 NGOs uh, and faith based organizations and churches, including the Council of Imams, uh, the Kenya Congress of Catholic Bishops, and let's see, uh, the Kenya National Congress of Pentecostal Churches and Ministries. So that's just a small uh, choice of. of organizations they met. Obviously, Kenya has lots of, you know, it's very vibrant civil society, lots of churches and FBOs, but in every country where there's an embassy, our, you know, there's, there's an effort by the embassy to try to help, you know, NGOs you know, worried about religious freedom in, in those countries. So uh, we, we recently produced a report that I that I wrote on Eritrea. And of course, Eritrea is a very unique country. It's not the typical, you know, country in Africa, um, but they have a uh, several dozen prisoners uh, locked up because they refused to serve in the, in the Eritrean military uh, because they're pacifists. And a great many of them are Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's one of our efforts of trying to get them released. Um, you know, again, you know, Eritrea is very different from Nigeria and Kenya and Mozambique. So there's a lot of variety, you know, different situations there. But uh, Eritrea is a CPC. It's one of our worst violators of religious freedom. So that's a, a country of particular concern. And our other country is Nigeria, because obviously there it's it's a different situation there because of the conflict in the north uh, between, you know, the Christians and Muslims, um, it's in a very different from Eritrea. So uh, those are our two uh, countries we're really focusing on. Now, I'm currently looking at the, uh, the, the Sahel countries. I'm concerned with what's, what's going on there with basically the jihadist movements, uh, the conflict with the military coming into power and the security situation there and the presence of the Wagner Group from Russia. They're, again, they're becoming a player. It's becoming a very geopolitical kind of a uh, contest in, in the Sahel region of Africa. So, and we're, you know, it's it's a lot of people, a lot of territory. So, a lot of it has to do with state and institutional control of the respective African governments. So, now, uh, final agency I'll talk about because I also work there. I've been around forever. Uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development. Okay, uh, I know everybody knows USAID, and of course, USAID does lots of things. You mentioned uh, diaspora movements. I worked with a fellow there when I was an aide on diaspora, leveraging diaspora uh, for economic development in Africa. That was a fascinating experience. Um, 
USAID is obviously it's been around since 1961, and they what they do is they basically work with Congress and use funds, using contracts, uh, con uh, cooperative agreements, and grants, uh, using organizations overseas, including faith-based organizations, civil society organizations, and sometimes you know what you might call churches. You know they do types of work. They use money. Uh, they use a they use a subsect a cross sectoral approach. So they have might have a conflict resolution program, an economic development program, a natural resource program, and at the same time they work with local religious leaders to try to help the environment, to stop conflict, uh, to improve democracy, to improve accountability and transparency. So this what we call cross sectoral. So USAID's been doing this for a long time, and they have many ty every country in Africa. Obviously, you know USAID, you know been around, and they've been doing this for and they have a lot of experience in how they do it. And they have, you know, their approach is a little bit different from State Department, and of course, very different from what we do, USERF. Um, they have regional and pillar bureaus. Uh, they uh, talked about global health and PEPFAR. I mean, PEPFAR funds that could also be leveraged using religious actors and how money is distributed. Um, you know, education, civic education, things of that sort. An example of a of a USAID program is in Nigeria. It's called CIP, C I P P. It's a Community Initiatives to Promote Peace program. It's a five-year USAID program, and what they want to do is empower local communities to prevent and respond to violence, okay, and violent extremism, okay, and to foster an enabling environment to, uh, for peace, policy advocacy, media outreach, and leakages to other uh, interfaith dialogues. Um, and of course, Nigeria, that's, that's, what, that's what, what we have to do. It's very complex because you have religious actors, but there's also a crossover between ethnic identity. You know the houses. You know, are that, are, you know, it depends on what you know. Do you see is it an ethnic issue or is it a religious conflict? So it's complicated. And so local FBOs uh, in Kenya, in Nigeria, the organization is called the Interfaith Mediation Center, the IMC. Uh, and there's also an organization called Pastoral Resolve, P-A-R-E. And these are examples of local FBOs in Nigeria that uh, USA leverages to try to, you know, use, use religious actors to, to produce conflict. So, and a second example, uh, there's too many to, to cite, but I don't. I, uh, Madagascar, you know, we tend to forget Madagascar. It's the island on the, on the eastern side. Catholic Relief Services, that's a big one, right? Uh, and they're probably the most famous, you know, disaster relief, you know, NGO around. Uh, one of the big ones, as long as, uh, as long as the Mormons, the LDS also have one. But they they uh, funded something called the Maharo Project. Uh, it it's, uh, focuses on food security and resili resilience. And it's, it runs from until 2024. And they're looking at maternal health care, nutrition, agriculture, and livelihood. But again, they're using local religious actors to try to spread the word and sort of crossing over between these different sectors. You know, you think, what does this have to do with religious and faith? But faith does have to do with it because faith actors are very important in the community. They can communicate with you know, education experts, food experts, farmers, and people in the government. So this is why it's all brought together in a cross-sectoral project. Now, these three government agencies, USAID, USERF, and State Department all have one thing in common. They're all trying to use religious actors as a, as a, a leveraging agent to, to protect the faith and for, Im, improve people's lives. You know, 54 countries in Africa, it's very complex, a lot of history. So the more help that's there, the more actors that are used, the better off we are. And of course, civil society has an advantage that uh, the government doesn't have. They're small, they're nimble, they're closer to the people. And of course, well, we mentioned corruption earlier. You know, corruption is a bit of a problem in Africa. Uh, you know, especially countries like Nigeria, and you know, if civil society organizations and FBOs can sort of dodge, you know, a lot of these things that the government stops and, and, and help people more closely, using churches, synagogues, mosques. You know, they're all there as actors to help. Oh. I guess that's everything. I, I could go on all day, but I'll cut it short. There's, it's a big government, so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you for getting us into these three very important agencies, by the way. I haven't, I haven't known as much about them as I have in the past few 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Um, so the way I want to do this is I'm probably going to ask just a follow-up one question for each of you, if you don't mind. And then I'm going to ask, I know the audience has a lot of good questions for you. I'm going to start with you, Mike. You you just you just finished last, so then I'll come to Angelique. Um, <clears throat> so the agencies you mentioned, and particularly your agency, because, you know, AFJN, we we interface with the U.S. government and, um, you know, we, we, we work in Africa. And we, that's why this relationship becomes very important. 
and um and some i think um sometimes you know for instance religious freedom you know has all kinds of connotations right depending upon where you're coming from and i'm not asking you this as a government officer now i mean i know sometimes when i you know we call the government officers how to get them because we so but the question i ask is how in terms of leveraging um when you leverage these categories cpc and um and these different categories right how does that impact us's relationship with the people so let me just say this so us has you have a government to government relationship sometimes but then sometimes when countries fall afoul let's say a country that's a cpc in this case eritrea or nigeria um how does the us government move beyond its relationship with the government but goes to actually you know and promoting democracy human rights with the people without necessarily focusing on the violations of human rights, the lack of religious tolerance, and all of these issues, which, I mean, AFGN is concerned about. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Thanks. So promoting religious freedom and democracy is a very, very delicate and complex task, as, as you can imagine. Uh, different countries, they, they all demand different tactics and strategies, and depending on you know who the political actors are, who the civil society actors are, it varies. And of course, because we have three major government agencies that, that are acting to protect religious freedom, they all have different tools and approaches in, in how to do this. You know, because I'm with the Congress, we work in a public forum. The people work with congressmen uh, that are very strong advocates of religious freedom, whether they're Christians, Muslims, uh, Jews, all, all, set, all groups in Congress. And they, these are the people that represent the people so they can go out in Congress and, and demand that you know investigations be made. And of course, they work with and sometimes against the, the executive branch, the State Department and the president, because they have different, uh, as you know, from setting your, your constitution, uh, checks and balances, the Congress and, and the executive branch, the president, they, they work against each other. They, they complement each other, but they also have different tools and they check on it, act, check at each other's what they can do. And so we'll uh, you serve the legislative branch will encourage the State Department to label a country as CPC, a country of particular concern. In this case, Nigeria, we want Nigeria to be listed as a CPC. But the State Department is a little more hesitant. They don't want to do that because Nigeria is the largest economy in Africa. And so they're, they're, they don't want to, to you know, prevent any kind of major economic issues, uh, societal issues by labeling them a CPC, by you know, causing you know, basically officials to be you know, denied visas or children not to be able to study in universities in the United States, not be able to travel abroad. However, there's another tool called a waiver. Uh, and India is a perfect example of a country that we would uh, would normally be labeled as CPC, a country of particular concern, but they, they give them the label, but they, they give them a waiver. So there's no real punishment. They'll say, you're a, you're a bad state, but we're not really going to punish you. We're, we're going we're to say that you're CPC, but we're going to say you can go ahead and do it but we're, because we're going to say because you're too much of an important steel, dual strategic actor and economic actor in the region. So that's another tool. So again, the government, the way the government works, it's, it's very complex. It's not, it's not cut and dry. It's not black and white. You know, there's lots of... Uh, a lot of negotiating, handshaking, you know, uh, agreements in the back between the three uh, U.S., the Congress, and the and executive branch. And State Department obviously has the embassy, so they know the most. They have all the connections. And, you know, what, the ambassador is the most important person in every country in the U.S. government. So he make, uh, he advises the president, and the president makes the final decision. And, of course, yeah, Congress is there to uh, sort of act as a check on the president and say, well, you know, this is, you know, we disagreed, but that's the role of Congress. And so I'm, you know, we're there to sort of, you know, go help the State Department, but also make sure the State Department does the right thing. You know, the, you know we, we, we consider them the proper thing. Uh, so again, there's there's lots of, uh, I guess, eddies and you know, complex ways of doing it. So it's not always simplistic. So thank you, and it's not always black and white. Um, you know, as I've learned, you see countries which have been listed, and sometimes the public officials are banned from coming here, but the U.S. tries to get through and deal with the people. Thank you so much. Um, Angelique, I wanted to come to you if you don't mind. Um, I think one of the things I talked about <clears throat> was this is a really broad topic, um, and I'm, I'm happy the angle in which you took. Um, so this question is really going to how U.S. has engaged Africa much more recently, but also looking at it now with um, the Biden, Biden administration's um, <clears throat> special office um, for the African diaspora. So I remember when we had the last U.S. Africa summit here, of which I attended, right? So what I found out from my experience is the U.S. doesn't really engage Africa in the way that it's organic. 
So it's really about specifically choosing countries and having specific relationships with them. So the relationship really never goes where it's supposed to be in terms of developing continent as well. And I've seen that a lot. And African countries, unfortunately, sometimes they, the few countries, you know, seek their own influence, their own interests as opposed to the broader continent. How do you think maybe now we have this, um, the administration, which is very serious about this, I think from what I've heard, we have names now. How do we use that office maybe in terms of really improving that relationship from a much more organic perspective instead of looking at the continent just from um, a commodification like the concern not about China, which is more about getting rid of China as opposed to really promoting the country, uh, the continent, I guess, thanks. Easier. so the first point is we don't know what the commission's going to do. Oh, okay, we have the executive order. We know what the mandate is from the White House. It's clear, I got the link for Bahati <laughs> to send to all of you. You can go to the White House website, it's clear what they say they are trying to do. Now, the, the as they say, the proof is in the pudding or the devil's in the details, if I may say it like that, is what is the methodology to get to the goals and objectives that are being outlined uh, with the White House? Uh, I was meeting with our wonderful group, ADNA, the other day, and they were asking me this, some of these similar questions. And my question has to do with what is going to be tactical, what is going to be pragmatic, what is not only going to be, if you will, um, a conversation as opposed to where the rubber meets the road. Um, and I don't know those answers. I think that the UN Permanent Forum is a help in finding a way forward. What I love about the Permanent Forum, and it's, a, I mean, now the Permanent Forum for Indigenous Peoples actually does some of this as well. Uh, the one around minority rights does some of this as well, what I'm getting ready to say, which is they bring the people most affected to the table. It's not just, the, uh, the member states matter, but we know that there are voices within the member states that don't get the voice and the visibility that is appropriate for them to have, even though they're part of the member states of the UN. So the permanent form says, we want the diaspora to be present. We want civil society of the diaspora to be present. And we want the same of African nations, not just the government leaders, but the people who are directly impacted by what policies are adopted. My dream, my imagination would be that this commission would do something similar that it would be creating a space so that the voices of those on the ground from, and, in, and since it is a U.S. construct and it's an African construct, that it would have clear uh, lines of accountability to civil society in some ways that may not have been designed by some other formulations before this moment. That's what my dream would be. I don't know what the methodology would be. I know we've got some highly visible people on the commission. I've been told there are three or four who may be thinking in a similar way, but I don't know if they can build consensus amongst them for that or not. I don't know what the limitations will be around the outreach. It's an executive order. It's not a congressional action. So what that means is <laughs> once President Biden, whoever the next president is, can say it doesn't exist, so it doesn't have the permanence. And, and that's one of the reasons why, like in the UN's case, that we've gone from the international decade of people uh, uh, of African descent to a permanent form of people of African descent. So my question is, what can you get done between now and the next president, right? And even when the next president gets in there, what can you do beyond that? I mean, we're talking about for the diaspora over 400 years of systematic assault and disempowerment, not only by governments, but by movements of people when it comes to uh, Africa and her children. How do we dismantle those things? How does that fit into a larger uh, proposal of imagining and dreaming what could have been like Wakanda, right? <laughs> just, just to say, you know what I mean? What, what, how do we get to the Wakanda dream in this moment that should have been, that wasn't, that needs to be 
if we really believe in democracy, we really believe in the Imago Day as people of faith. All God's children, all God's children matter. So I'm looking for that. That's what I'm looking for. I don't have the answers. I'm not going to prejudge or predetermine what the what the commission will actually do. But that would be my hope that we look very critically on what does it mean to have those streams of accountability and link to a reimagination of what it means to live within the reality of the Imago Day and human rights. And I will say to uh, Michael's point around the UN, we just celebrated the 75 years too at the World Council of Churches. World Council of Churches was founded the same year as the UN. And we've been journeying with them since the League of Nations when we were being created in the 30s. Obviously, the UN and the World Council of Churches had to be postponed because of what? World War II, right? <laughs> so we ended up being found. So we've been journeying in our public policies at World Council of Churches since the UN, and we have a very close working relationship with them. So I would just simply say we've been at this journey for a while, uh, but we've got a long way to go, uh, Dr. Stephen. And um, I just hope in this moment, even if it is an executive order, which means it's temporary until it becomes permanent with the Congress, uh, that we can get at least a few things done, at least lay some foundation of what it might mean to have some permanence to a commission that can do what it needs to do for all of God's children. Thank you, Angelica. And I share your optimism about this small window that we can do something, but I also hope that it becomes permanent because the idea of you know, temporality is how you know issues around Africans have been dealt for so many years. Why don't you make it a congressional act so it becomes a law? And these are some of the things that we should be fighting for as um, you know civil society organizations. So I am going to open the floor. <clears throat> for those who are joining us online, we are having a panel here on the US-Africa relations, opportunities and challenges. On my left, I have Angelique, and I have a mic on my right, two very distinguished um, experts. So I'm going to open the floor for audience to ask your questions. Please make it as brief as you can so that we can have as many questions in um, within the next 30 minutes, including the audience um, online. Anybody want to go first? I'll start with Father Baz, and then we'll go to Faustin. So, my name is Father Bartholomew. Thank you, Dr. Angelique, and thank you, Dr. Mike, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, myself, my question is, in the best interests of peace and democracy in Africa, the different faith tradition that you've been engaging as the very eminent Kenyan scholar called Ali Mazuri, Africa is a triple heritage. Muslim, Christians, and African traditional religion. I've seen that you engage more Muslims and Christians. And usually in most African countries where there is conflict, people go back to traditional leaders whom many believe are the real leaders because Christianity came from outside as they see it and Muslim as well. So these are people who hold a very important, I would say, space. So I wanted to know how do you engage that space, especially going forward for peace and justice across Africa? Yeah, I, last November, I went out to West Africa and I visited Ma Ghana, Benin, and Togo. And I wanted to see the, the influence of the church and religion uh, throughout the centuries. And of course, I started off in Ghana and I saw the, you know, a lot of the castles and you know the churches, the oldest Catholic church in Elmina. You know, in you know, another castle. And then when I got to Benin, I had the pleasure of visiting some uh, voodoo sites, uh, some voodoo temples. And that was, to me, a fascinating uh, experience to see that and, and learn about that. Uh, part of USERP's goals and strategies and priorities is protecting all people of religious faith uh, for freedom of religion and belief, including indigenous beliefs. Uh, the recent uh, Nigerian president election of President Bola uh, we actually made a tweet, uh, tweet, you serve uses social media, to try to uh, advocate to Congress and the State Department and to other actors, including African actors, to do th certain things. And we advocated to protect indigenous uh, beliefs and the right to practice. 
um, because it, there's a it's 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 a sizable uh, indigenous religious uh, minority in, in Nigeria, but it's there. It's very visible. And of course, it's a large country. So uh, if there's if that's five or four percent of the population out of 230 million, that's still significant. And so, but across Africa, you have indigenous actors, and we want to protect everybody. Uh, you know, especially the traditional faith practitioners. Practitioners. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, one of the, the instruments that I didn't name that I should have named earlier uh, is, of course, the African Union. I mean, I mentioned the free trade agreement and all that. OK, uh, but really, CEDO, uh, some of you may or may not know the division called CEDO, uh, CEDO, which is dealing with, quote, the sixth region of Africa. Africa Union has six regions, not five, but six. That includes the African diaspora. And there's been a lot of work done uh, within the last five to 10 years on trying to build the capacity of the voices of the diaspora as the sixth region of African Union. Within that department is a group called CEDAW. And uh, underneath CEDAW is another stream that deals with religious freedoms uh, throughout the six regions. And in that commission that, and I, I'm, honored to be a part of some of those meetings from time to time, there is affirmation of the importance of traditional religious societies and groups and spiritualities that meet there. It's really quite remarkable. And the conversations are totally different <laughs> from even, so I do ecumenical work. I've done conventional interfaith work. But when we meet with the uh, leaders of the various religious communities throughout the continent that are there is a totally different conversation. And it engages, if you will, the, the monotheistic religions as well, like Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, et cetera. But the, the, the perspectives are so important. That, that's what I want to say to your question, that you have tables that involve the voices at the table. And quite honestly, there aren't that many tables that take seriously the voices of indigenous perspectives, historic, ancient perspectives that have always been there. So what I want to name in this moment is we need to have more convening tables all over the world that take seriously indigenous perspectives. I'm very pleased that at World Council of Churches, we have a whole department that is having that engagement. We not only have interfaith engagement and not only ecumenical engagement, but also we have a whole indigenous department uh, with the work that we're doing. I'm very pleased to say Bread for the World now has um, a, 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 an eye of how it is we engage indigenous perspectives relative to public policy around food insecurity. So I just want to lift it up as being critical to our future. And the truth be told, when we look at issues around hunger and poverty, as we look at the soil, we look at climate and all those issues, we have to look to indigenous perspectives that have been here since day one to understand how it is we approach having the kind of nutritious food we need going forward. What are the practices of agriculture, the practices of diet, and so in many respects, I would say our indigenous brothers and sisters, wherever they may be, including the continent of Africa and in so-called North America, which is appropriately called Turtle Island from an indigenous perspective, by the way, um, that is the way forward. So I, I really want to thank you for the question. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Postine here. Thank you for such a thought-provoking um, remarks. And my, I actually have a comment, if I may, um, and a small question mark to the comment that I'll make. But I first of all just wanted to contextualize what you've all shared in terms of the evolution of US-Africa relations. And I think that I keep saying this to myself, Africa has never been in a better position to negotiate in terms of what it wants out of its relationship and engagement with the, not just the US, but with the world as well. And I want to remind ourselves of um, in 2014 was, I think, the very first time ever that there was ever a first um, U.S. engagement strategy that was developed. There was the first one ever. I mean, we, Mike, you talk about USAID having in existence since the 60s. 
but we just never had an engagement strategy. In other words, we responded to the needs of people on the continent, great, but a lot of the priorities were not decided by the people on the continent. When President Obama launched the first ever engagement strategy with Africa was to change that relationship so that it's a shift from donor recipient to partnership. And I think that's the world we are in today. With the battle between major powers and China and Africa, this is, this is a very clear articulation of Africa is not just a place to receive aid. Africa is not a place where there's so much poverty that everybody wants to go to to help. Africa needs to believe in ourselves. And uh, I think to Angelique's point with regard to um, the Africa Union's Agenda 2063 priorities for the continent, bringing those to bear on policies around climate justice, around the exploitative trade agreements that hold Africa back, but also leveraging the greatest um, asset that Africa has today, the youth dividend. Innovations and technologies that are out of this world, but for some reason kind of remain under the radar. And meanwhile, we are chasing <laughs> to be invited to the table. For me, that's the struggle. And I hope that even as we celebrate 40 years with AFJ and that we can get you know, more strategic about our analysis to really inform areas of policy that would bring about that change. I mentioned those areas just because Angelique, you talk about the climate justice movement today. I mean, Africa has contributed the least to climate change, but bears the largest share of its effects. So how does Africa use its um, economic advantage today in the, in the sense that so many actors want to be partners with Africa, but really use that as a strength to bring to the table what Africa wants versus the other way around. On the forum that you just talked about, the Diaspora Council, and I think that's, if we get this right, as you've, you've explained, perhaps to Dr. Stevens' point, codifying it. Other regions of the world have more kind of longer term um, engagement plans, but I think with Africa, there has not been. And as you rightly mentioned, after this administration, a few months from now, the council may not exist. This is not the first time such a proposition has been put forward. So I think it's very important as we look to the some of this forum, but what to do next? And hopefully more of these conversations coming out of this 40th celebration can help inform that going forward. But in my view, it would need to be codified. Congress is very much involved in the US, Africa, I mean, sorry, China, Africa relations. Perhaps that's the partner to kind of push this um, conversation to it. I submit back. Well, I, I shouldn't ever come behind Faustine. I mean, I but I'm going to take a take a chance. <laughs> I'm humble. I, I, I just want to celebrate what she said. I mean, we we um, need to better understand the context in which we find ourselves. And I think I just want to underscore the importance of moving to partnership. I just think that has to be our thinking. That's why when I was thinking about the uh, youth uh, empowerment, it has to be mutual. Women, it has to be mutual. It's this whole issue around partnership. We have to learn from the young people. Young people need to learn. We need to learn from each other, right? And so I think that the whole dynamic of being humble before each other is a key virtue because this is a faith community as well. That virtue of humility uh, I think it's going to be key for us to move to the next levels. It's important for us to listen to the 12 year old who talks through TikTok and doesn't talk through, you know, even, you know, this, you know, or anything else, you know, I just think it's a period of profound humility and really being able to listen to each other in ways we haven't heard each other. And I think that's for public policy leaders too. I know that's hard to say in this moment when we're extremely polarized, but I think that virtue is one of the missing ingredients that has brought us to this moment of profound polarization. So I just want to mention that from a faith perspective. Thank you, um, Angelique. And next question, and just before the next question, and just to your point, Faustina, and I think this is just a question I'm asking as well in terms of you know these 
you know, multipolar world with Africa being commodified, maybe the question also we should be asking ourselves as Africans is, how do we use this in an opportunistic way um, <clears throat> instead of becoming passive objects of power? So, like, if we if there's an if there's all this fight and going for Af to Africa for anything, how does Africa engage in a way that's beneficial to itself, as opposed to expecting the folks who are coming in there to be altruistic about their engagement, which is very less likely to happen. As I always see, the ambitions they have for Africa is far less than the potential that Africa has. And that's how we have to understand this relationship. All right. Um, next question. I think um, Father Father, um, Father was going to ask, and then um, after that, I will go to Dr. Ferrer, and then I will go to you. All right, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'm Father Rufino, as I'm of the Comboni Missionaries, and I'm happy to hear that Michael was in Ghana, Togo, and Benin. Our missionaries are there, and I did work in Benin for six years, so I know what it means visiting those places. Uh, thanks to both of you for the enlightenment. In terms of uh, the US-Africa relations, I have one question, something which disturbs me of late, and I don't know how really to address it. And it's now coming maybe to two years when we uh, apply for visas for our members to come over either to visit or even to work. Now it's becoming a nightmare. Sometimes they put these people who have asked, the, we finish all the paperwork here, we send to the embassies, and it's put in the queue. Is it because there is no money? And if there is no money, I know that sometimes they limit the number of visas to be issued. Suppose there is only 1,000 needed to be given visas to come to the U.S., but they receive applications of over 20,000. And those fees you pay, and which is not refundable, why can't you use that money to get more people in order to expedite these services? Thank you. Well, I believe, uh, obviously, the State Department has a, plays an important role in granting visas because people tend to apply or often apply for them at their, the embassies in the country where they're uh, visiting from. And the U.S. government bureaucracy, you know, is, is complex and is slow, uh, even the best of times. But I believe the COVID, uh, COVID epidemic definitely played a big part in disrupting a lot of the activities and, and the, the, the processes, procedures of uh, acquiring visas and, and looking at visas. And I think that's one part of it. Um, again, state I was a different part of the State Department. Uh, I wasn't anywhere near the visa office. Uh, you know, it's such a large you know, department. So I would just say that I know it, it works both ways. Uh, we, are, we are currently sending some people abroad to visit some countries, and they're trying to get their visas. So there are decisions made at the, at the higher political level, whether to grant visas, based on different variables and factors. Uh, obviously, it, not every person's the same, so it depends on who you are and where you're going. Uh, but I think there's quite a few issues. Uh, again, a lot of it's the government can be complex, and there's things happen. Is you know, the people doing the, looking at the visas or contractors, whether they're over. There's an overload of you know, applications. There's not enough staffing. That's probably the big part of it, more than likely, unless it, you're a very you know politically sensitive person trying to get in. That's a different situation. But I think, and I think it, it sounds more like a sort of a log jam, uh, and, and again, it falls back to bureaucracy and, and inability to, to bring the people in, and just end up people working in the, in the right spot. Again, it's a big government, uh, and it's a big department, so where do you put the staffing, where the staffing should be? You know, it, you know, there should be better priorities and concentrations of people. Thank you, Mike. And um, Angelique, you definitely don't want to answer a question on visa, right? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll leave that for Michael. All right. Um, so, so in the interest um, for the next two questions, I know I had um, Lydia. I'll go to you. Do you have any questions coming from online, from the visa? Okay, damn. I just want to make sure they are been listening. So, I'll go to Dr. Faria on the right, and then um, who else? Yes, um, the priest, and then um, Father Ebuka. So, what I will do is to combine your questions and make sure that we have enough time to respond to them. All right, um, Dr. Faria, go ahead. Yeah, this question is about uh, U.S. government funding for Africa. Uh, there is a big disconnect between uh, the billions of dollars that the U.S. spends in Africa. Uh, we have actually lost prominence 
uh, China and Russia are way on top. We are putting money into areas that cannot be seen by the common man. Uh, governance, democracy, freedom, human rights, healthcare. The common person cannot see uh, what's happening. So the U.S. is losing prominence. Um, we have fantastic policies. I think last year, two very big policies came out, one on sub-Saharan Africa and the other one on global water. Uh, the U.S. government tied both those issues to uh, U.S. national security. So my question is as follows. What can the diaspora do to speak with one voice, to tell the U.S. government and to tell USAID that, hey, Africa has changed. Your spending priorities should also change to match what's happening on the ground. Uh, as an example, uh, Judd Devermont, who is the senior advisor to the president, recently gave a speech and told uh, the audience that the U.S. has been consistent in its spending for the last 20 years. Unfortunately, he does, does not know that Africa has changed. So what can the diaspora do to change the narrative and to make sure that the U.S. government puts money in the right places that can actually benefit the common man? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farah. We'll take one, we'll take another question. Yes, Father, if you can be very brief so that, yeah, go ahead. Um, again, I, I want to thank uh, Evgen uh, and all, all who have contributed. And um, listening to the speakers, it seems to me there is a certain uh, hesitation. Um, to addressing a question of philosophy. What is the driving philosophy? I hear Dr. Angelik, you talk about methodology. Uh, what is the overriding philosophy for what AFGN is doing and what the US-African uh, relations doing? And it, it seems to me that that is being avoided. So I will I, I will make a recommendation that AFGN be, include a philosophy for Africa because it seems to me that's what is missing. Everything else you've been doing in the past 40 years, uh, Sister Brown just mentioned that it remains the same thing. We must then approach it from the point of view of the philosophy for and here I'm, I'm talking about philosophy for education in Africa is right now and has always been a colonial philosophy of education. It has meant an education that fosters European way of life and the church influences in the continent. And this has been done by both state and the church. So when you are talking about promoting uh, democracy in Africa, well, you can spend all the money you want. I just came back from Nigeria on a two weeks visit. I, I was in Cote d'Ivoire prior uh, earlier this year. And are you going to promote uh, uh, democracy in a situation where people can't even express themselves? How is the democracy going to work? So we need to include philosophy of education that is relevant in this case. That is to say, move away from the colonial missionary education that is right now the neocolonizing philosophy operating in all of Africa and probably also in African diaspora. And what does this philosophy of education do? It is just massaging the same structures of the 20th century government and church organization, the same top down. I want us to move away from that kind of philosophy to a Christian religious education of the Gospels, that is Jesus that we see in the Gospels, Gospels S. That is to say, 
the Jesus that says to the paralytic, take your mat and go home. <laughs> the Jesus that is always interested in the individual. What do you want me to do for you? And you say it, he says, okay, receive your sight. Make the lame walk. Make the blind to see. Not see because of what you are going to do for me. But you see because seeing is good for you. The education that is operating right now in most of Africa is education that is still tied to Washington, D.C., tied to Rome, probably now China. Not really uh, for the good and benefit of the individual in Africa. Not really that. So I'll get my... I, I hope I, I haven't... <laughs> Yeah, we have, we have. Um, I I'll hope get... you got my 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 point because yeah. right now I, I don't know why. By the way, you have Africa here at the map, and we are still using the various uh, uh, co co country countries in Africa. Can we do what the uh, uh, development studies does and look at the 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 map of Africa and say there is a place in Africa called the trigger point of Africa. The big elephant in the room to solving any African problem or most of African problem is getting the problem in Nigeria right. That's why they consider Nigeria as the trigger point for Africa. It, Africa is like a shotgun and without a trigger. That's where Nigeria is. And that's where all the problems are. All right, let's get, get it the... right there. We'll get it right. Let's get the speakers. Places. Let's get the panelists to respond. Okay, thank, you. thank you so much, Father, for that. Um, All right. So I think there's one question about disconnect. I mean, both of them are really about disconnect. Sounds like one of them on disconnect and funding, and then um, the philosophy question. Um, I don't know who wants to say what. So it's open. Yeah. So I I like to speak to the question about funding. Um, so one of the things that we do at Bread is called this offering of letters, and it's a tool. It's a very simple tool that seeks to uh, build a relationship between people who live in their communities with their congressional leaders. In the United States, ultimately, the buck stops with the people who can vote in this country. The people who exercise their power and their voice at the local levels. Every congressional leader on the Hill has a thread that goes back to somebody in a local community who exercise their power of voting and not just voting, but those who engage the relationship with their policymakers, their policymakers at the local level, at the state level, and at the uh, federal level. Ultimately, the way you shift things in this country is you must have a relationship with the power structure. And that's what it is. So I, all of us, and it doesn't matter really if you're a citizen or not. It ma what matters is if you live someplace, you've got to exercise your power. And you need to build those relationships from the bottom up. Everyone in this room ought to be able to call the name of the people in your commission, your state legislature, and your federal government your two senators, and your representatives. If you don't know their names, if you don't have their address, if you don't have their email, you're not fulfilling what it takes because that's what shifts the narrative of funding. That's what shifts the narrative of policies. It's called organizing. Most of what happens on that hill is because of organized power. Organized power. And if we're not engaged in that process, we're not having a real conversation. And I'm sorry to be just that blunt. If you don't like what's going on on that hill, which a lot of people don't, it starts with who it is that's coming from your community. And by the way, who are you lifting up to represent you? You in this, at least in this country, as I've lived it, you are not left with just the choices you don't need to, you don't want to live with. You can build up some young people 
to represent your interests. You can build up some folk who you know you like, who you trust. Now, it's not perfect. Look, we know people of African descent know it's not perfect. But sometimes we don't even maximize the tools in our toolkit. So I just want to say to you in a very strong way, maximize your voice and maximize your power. Now, I will also give a commercial. Bread for the World has some free tools to help you do that. It's called our offering of letters. You go to www.bread.org. Now we're clear. We want to end hunger and poverty. Okay. That is our focus. We're very focused. Bread is one of the most focused places I know. I think Faustine will say that. We Every year we adopt a legislative agenda and we have a global agenda and a national agenda. And at the end of every year, my performance whether I'm at bread or not, I've been there for nine years, by the way, I'm not doing too bad. Evaluated, you are evaluated, your work is evaluated by, did we move the dime on concrete legislation? Is that precise? So I would throw it back to you. What is your issue? What do you care about? You are in the position, and, and, and let me just strengthen the, 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 verse, the verse around African diaspora. The African diaspora has a primary responsibility, not a secondary, but a primary responsibility to advocate for our kindred on the continent. And if we're not doing that, if your congressional leader doesn't know that from you and your churches and your neighborhoods and all of that, we're not having a real conversation. That's really pretty much what we have to say. So ultimately, in this construct, I want to encourage you to do that. And then about philosophy, I absolutely agree with you, my brother. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. Decolonizing the narrative. We writing, rewriting our narrative, the colonized narrative around Africa being this negative, this negative, this negative. The images, the stereotypes of people of Africa and African descent is unacceptable. We've got to write that story. We've got to rewrite that story. And so these whole movements to do erasure of books, banning of books and storytelling around groups that have not, quote, been at the center of the conversation is unacceptable. So we have to be proactive and have a philosophy of telling the truth. For me, it's not even racialized or even ethnic uh, uh, perspectives. This is biblical. All of God's children matter. All of our stories matter. And God created us that way. And we need to start lifting up the beauty of all of the stories. So I just want to say the philosophy for me is the Imago Day, God's creation, and saying, you have something to say. I have something to say. And by the way, there's this thing called the, the, the commandments in the, in, the, in the gospel that says, love God, love neighbor, love self. Remember, Jesus said that's the fulfillment of the law. Yeah, that's how we approach it. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, I don't have to follow up on that. <laughs> this is a challenge. Uh, every day I go to my uh, local coffee vendor. Uh, he's from Addis Ababa. He's Ethiopian. And he's, he has a very strong opinion about everything especially Africa. Uh, of course, he, he's a businessman. He's very well-respected well in the community. Uh, he lives in Maryland, but his business, business is in Virginia. So he's, he's discovering the local politics of the DMV. Uh, so now he knows about Ethiopian politics as well as American politics and Virginia and Maryland. Again, he is a, is a very important resource for his family and kin in Ethiopia. He, he sends money back to his family. He sends advice. He sends uh, ideas. He sends messages on how, how to do things, what to do to you know to his family in Ethiopia. Of course, you know Ethiopia is in, in, going through another complex situation. It's always very complex there, in terms of uh, there's instability. Uh, there's always regional rivalries, fighting. Um, and of course, again, he's, he has a very different perspective from different people in, in his country, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, he's, 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 he calls himself an Ethiopian, uh, not so much a Tigrayan or, you know, or, or an Amaric. Uh, but again, he represents the diaspora, uh, which is a very, very important resource in the United States or across the world in Europe as well for Africans. Uh, again, 
I could give you statistics on the billions and trillions of dollars that have flowed from the U.S., from the World Bank, from the U.N. to Africa uh, through uh, uh, official de de development assistance, ODA funds, lots of money. But you could say, what has that money really done? Has, has Africa uh, improved over several decades? You could say, well, you know, maybe in terms of the money has been sent, maybe it hasn't. Now, you still have the same democratic deficit. You have people that are unhappy. You have this youth, youth bulge. I remember hearing about that when I started USCID. You know, you know this young group of people, this cohort, that would, they're going to demand change. They're going to have greater expectations of their political systems. Uh, they want better jobs. Uh, they have you know higher educations, and so this they expect this. And of course, uh, what happened in 2011 and 12, the Arab Spring, the Arab Revolt, and where did it start? In Tunisia, North Africa. Again, didn't so much affect Sub-Saharan Africa, but the ideas were there. Uh, the the the, the, the corrupt. Uh, upper elite that have been established there for decades uh, through families. Uh, they're not improving the life of the average African, and they, they want change. And I think it uh, applies to across Africa. Nigeria is a perfect example. It's a functioning democracy, but again, there are very uh, blatant issues, uh, problems there. Uh, again, religious divide between lar two very large groups. Um, uh, again, Ethiopia, or Nigeria has a history of sort of decentralizing, you know, uh, th through ethnic identity and religion. And again, you know, I think it's sort of leading that way again. And uh, again, Ethiopia on the east side of Africa is very similar. So these two very large, important countries are undergoing similar uh, changes. And it all boils down to young people wanting change, uh, 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 distrust of the uh, government officials, the elite, the political parties. Liberia had an election, I believe it was yesterday. Uh, DRC has an election coming up. Uh, again, DRC is a very important country in the middle of Africa. Uh, again, who's going to win? Is it going to be an established politician? You know, the same the same story, the same parties. Or is it going to be a newcomer who wants and demands change? And uh, who who are the young people going to vote for? Who are they going to support? Would they get advice from the diaspora? Hopefully, they will because the uh, diaspora are important actors, religious actors, FBOs. They can work with the diaspora. They're like this important linchpin uh, in in Africa. And, and of course, my my government office does works with these or organizations in Africa. To help improve the lives of Africans using faith-based initiatives, civil society is a very critical actor because it's not the government. It can dodge the government uh, corruption. It goes straight to the people. It dodges the the, the, the parliamentarian, the judge, uh, whatever leader that's you know it's holding up change. The president, the governor, you know, the church, the faith-based actor can go straight to the person, listen, and say, "Okay, we're going to help you. We're going to get your money through our diaspora overseas, and we're going to demand change and use that uh, avenue to do it." So again. The private sector and civil society are critical actors, especially faith-based uh, organizations and churches and religious groups. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for that. Thanks for that expose. Um, I've been a little we It's 12.36. Um, this panel was supposed to end at 12.30, but we were a little bit late. So what I'll do is just take one question um, because um, Father Ebu Chris Han has been up, and then um, I will try to kind of summarize this so that we can keep up with other things. There are a lot of exciting things. And so I'll go for Father Eboka. Uh, maybe the last question for today, if you don't mind, as brief as you can. So okay, we can keep up. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Um, what I want to offer to our panelists maybe to comment on is two things. Uh, uh, Dr. Angelique, I'm glad you mentioned trade. Uh, perhaps how can your work with Brad and maybe this new commission that the president um, put together, how can they help to make Africa a trade partner, right? And the reason why I'm saying that is you look at different parts of the world, Germany, Japan, Korea, all these places that fought the world war, most of them fought against the United States. They are now partners. They're not um, just simply the ones that just receive aid. We drive German cars. We use Korean vehicles. We use different things, right? Because they 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 were considered partners. So even in agriculture, Africa has huge land, but Africans don't easily import, export their product to the United States. Rather, the United States gives us food packs in the name of food aid. How can the U.S. see the Afri Africa as just a trade partner, not a place to dump out the U.S. troops or the U.S. drone stations, right? That's one thing. And on the other thing, coming to your mic, is we talk about corruption. That's fine. 
but how can maybe your work and maybe the work of this commission help identify the U.S. politicians who aid African governments in that corruption so that they can be stopped and pressures can be put to the African leaders so that the corruption can end. Thank you. Thank you so much. So maybe as a way of um, ending this, I will, you get you will respond to these questions and then summarize your your really wonderful presentations. I know they want to listen as much as they can. Um, so who wants to go first? Briefly, I'll go. I, I, I could spend hours and do lectures on this. It's development, uh, comparative politics, one hundred and one. Government to government assistance. That's basically what the U.S. government does: bilateral aid to Africa, uh, to African countries. Uh, multilateral assistance: the United Nations, the World Bank, uh, U.S. tax dollars go there. Again, I ask the question: How effective are these funding streams been in helping Africa? Uh, you, you could argue you know, not so successful, depending on where you are. I mean, it depends on the country. But again, you mentioned Congress and people in Congress, you know, being listening to their constituents. Again, I think there's a Distrust now, you know, and there's polarization in the United States uh, across, you know, the political system. If people want change. You know, the two-party system is not working. They're not listening to what we want. And again, what's happening in the U.S. is, you know, in Africa, you could say it's been going on for decades. You know, depending on what country you're in. So again, I, I, I repeat, private sector, civil society, society religious actors, faith-based actors, churches. This is a way for people to, to help people and to to inspire them to, and to improve their lives. Uh, it can dodge the government. It can avoid, you know, it's not aid. This is not foreign aid. This is not a loan. This is people sending money and advice to people. And that's the way things should be done. Uh, Africa, uh, unfortunately, you know, loses a lot of people that, you know, study and learn and then they move abroad. And, they, and there's a loss of education and skills. And that's that's hurting the country. Uh, if, you know, if that would change and people would stay in Africa you know, and everybody would learn and, you know, help the education system boost it, everybody would benefit in this case. Um, Again, it, you know, there's two different approaches, the government to government and there's civil society. And I think civil society is, is a very, very viable alternative. And I think part of what my, my agency at, US, at USURF in the government works with NGOs and, and private religious actors, you know, a different, different focus, religious freedom. But the idea is there. If you have religious freedom, you can live in society, you can be open, you can be transparent. And that sort of evolves across into economic action, to education, doing other things, you know, your human rights, your Guaranteed in the United Nations, you know, HR. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, and I actually talk about this in my book coming up, but I, I think that there are basically two tracks to addressing the fundamental issues on the table around change uh, that is positive for Africa and Africa, the African diaspora. <clears throat> One is what I outline as a, an agenda of reform. In other words, when we deal with policy and structures and that kind of thing, to some extent, we're dealing with reforming what we have, right? But the transformative work, the stuff that's the, even more sustainable and longer lasting has to be both that and what Michael, I think, is also alluding to, which is civil society and faith-based institutions that are included in that that other place where civil society can do what happened in Tunisia, for example, or what happened in this country, right? I mean, what happened in 1776? What happened in 1865? That was civil society to, to a great extent that tired of what was happening. Now it resulted in a lot of bloodshed. Well, that's another matter. But it was people on the ground who said enough is enough and we cannot continue to live this way. And it's happened throughout Africa's history as well. So I think we have to think about what is long-term change and what is immediate change. Right now, for example, bread is supporting the farm bill. The, the farm bill is domestic and it is global. It has a program in there called SNAP. Many of you probably heard about it. It deals with the immediate urgencies of people being able to put food on the table. But also in that bill is um, a proposal to help uh, African instituted institutions, academic institutions, as well as historic black uh, uh, colleges and universities to come up with proposals of research 
that go back to looking at indigenous practices, by the way, uh, historic practices that have been more sustainable in ways that right now we cannot keep with, keep up with what we've been doing. So that's a more longer term, I think, transformative agenda around the farm bill is looking at those long-term pieces. So I think when we're thinking about agriculture, we're thinking about the future, we have to think about local leadership. We have to think about resources that are gonna help us to move to the longer term, uh, dealing with issues like climate. Um, we, we have to look beyond what we see in front of us. So um, I want to encourage you to, to think about when you're thinking about policies and thinking about grassroots strategies, to have at least two tiers. What is the immediate and what is the long term? They don't always go quite together, but sometimes they do. And that's the wisdom of organizing and bringing people to a common table. So you have the ownership to move, if you will, move voices and quite frankly, to move power uh, so that things can change. So I I think that's another hopeful, helpful point. Well, thank you, Angelic. And um, I know it's um, it's 12.45, it's 15 minutes way behind the launch, but you were so awesome. So we probably would have sat here and listened to this really wonderful conversation. And by the way, you know, I'm happy for this, especially the questions that came out, you know, it speaks to ideas about philosophy and which is what AFG and focusing on structures. And we feel like the long-term plan really is about changing the structures. And our understanding of the U.S.-Africa relations and all of the opportunities is really giving power to the Africans to determine their agenda. I want to see a U.S.-Africa meeting where the president of the U.S. goes to Africa and meets with the heads of state rather than having 52 private jets flying here to meet one president. And that is what we think is more sustainable. And thank you so much for this very, very thoughtful, provoking conversation. And thank you to the audience. Can we please give them a very big hand?